Hey everybody, so I'm continuing to learn about and spotlight organizations that exist at the intersection of food and racial justice. One of these organizations is the Black Church Food Security Network, which, according to their website, works to organize and link historically African-American congregations in urban and rural areas to advance food and land sovereignty by doing such things as establishing gardens on church-owned lands, connecting black farmers with farmers markets held on church properties, and helping churches and the neighborhoods they serve to build power for historically marginalized black communities. This podcast will be making a donation to them, and I hope you'll consider doing the same. They're currently conducting a drive called the Food, Faith, and Freedom Summer, where they're attempting to raise $100,000 for their efforts, and it would be awesome to get them even a little bit closer. You can learn more about them and donate at blackchurchfoodsecurity.net, and I found out about them via a great website about food and social justice called Civil Eats, which is at civileats.com. Thanks, and here's the rest of the show. Hello, and welcome to Stay for Dinner, a podcast of cooking, curiosity, and conversation. If you love cooking, hate cooking, don't know how you feel about cooking because you've never tried it before, congratulations, you are in the right place. The place at the moment is my small apartment kitchen. My, as in me, I'm, I need to not make this as much of a segue as it is. I'm DZ Pearson. I'm a comedian, author, enthusiastic home cook. And today on the show, I will be putting a second entry in a series that I guess I will call The Grandma Files, or something catchier. I, uh, I had my grandma Mary from Pittsburgh, uh, my stepmom's mom, on a few weeks ago to share her red sauce recipe, and I thought, we gotta have equal time for these grandmas. I have two other living grandmas, and I would like to try to have them on the show. So I reached out to my dad's mom, Jan, my granny, Jan. She lives in northern Arizona. She is a former judge in the state of Arizona. She is a super cool, smart, on-the-ball, funny woman who I am extremely in great in grateful to indebted to indebted to in 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 many ways i think we're a lot alike i think you can uh, pick that out when we talk to each other and we'll be doing that later but in the meantime well one thing i, I should say is that when i reached out to her uh, i was like yeah i had mary on and she shared this recipe with me do you have anything like that that you would like to share and because she's a big cook and she would make thanksgiving or a lot of thanksgiving in our family for many years and she said no i don't really have anything like that so i said great we'll just talk about food and cooking and life in general so that is what we're going to do i will be speaking to her remotely a little bit later but in the meantime i am going to be making a very quick and easy recipe that I love. Haley found this recipe. It is by Jenny Rosenstrach, who wrote the book Dinner, A Love Story, I believe named after her blog of the same name. And it's a really, really cool cookbook. I actually checked it out from the library once. I need to buy it. It's a really neat book. And it has a recipe in it that I love that's a like red wine braised pork shoulder that I actually briefly thought about having be the inaugural recipe that I would make on this very show. That is how much I like it. This recipe is for Avgo Lomono. It is a Greek chicken soup and it has orzo and lemon and almost kind of an uh, somewhat like egg drop soup because you are tempering some eggs into some hot broth, but unlike egg drop soup, you're not having individual sort of wispy ghosts of egg. It's all incorporated and you end up with this really beautiful looking, trying to get a cat away from the chicken. (laughs) It's really beautiful looking yellow opaque consistency. It's like bright yellow and it's a combination of egg and lemon, I think that gives it that color. And it's awesome. I really like it and we've made it once before and it comes together really quickly. It's super easy and also it's a soup that you can still have in summertime. It's very light and delicious and scratches that chicken soup itch while also being, I don't know, how many times can I say the word light? It's light, it's light, you gotta like it. And you don't even need to actually have 
chicken on hand to put it in there. That is optional. You could just do it with stock and orzo and egg, and I think be pretty perfectly happy. We do happen to have chicken because I did roast a chicken this weekend, so I will be shredding some of that. Oh, also dill. It has dill in it, and dill is great. Whether we're talking about the To Kill a Mockingbird character or the herb, it's, you're never not happy to see it. All right, so first up, quick check of my ingredients calls for four cups of chicken broth. I have about two cups of homemade stock, quarantine project, and I meant to make more, didn't get around to it, so we're gonna be thinning it out. I think it's pretty concentrated, so we'll try to get up to four cups of liquid because we like to have that. A quarter cup of orzo, I might honestly be using more. Last time we felt like, ooh, we could use more orzo, and we definitely can because we have a one pound box, and I feel like we would get at least six meals out of this. Orzo, I will admit to you, have underrated it for years, but no more. This soup has been the gateway. Three eggs, we have pretty tiny ones, that's okay. Might use a fourth, we'll see how we feel. Three tablespoons of lemon juice, I'll probably, I imagine I'll be using one lemon for that, maybe two, um, or like one and a half. A handful of fresh dill, got that, and shredded rotisserie chicken. Like I said, we have some chicken left over from this weekend that we'll be using. I'll probably be using like a breast and a wing, maybe. First step, we are going to bring the broth, or in this case, the stock and a little bit of water into a saucepan and bringing them to a boil. I have what I would describe as a medium saucepan. Adding my additional water to get my overall liquid amount up. Turning the heat on, gonna wait for that to come up to temperature. And while we do that, gonna do a little bit of my prep work here. First, I'm gonna juice this lemon. Got a little juicer here. Yeah, I'm definitely gonna want another lemon. There we go, that's more like it. So I ended up using like two full lemons. And I'm ultimately going to be whisking my eggs and lemon together in a medium bowl. So I'm gonna go ahead and crack the eggs into the medium bowl now. My stock and water combo, I guess it's just diluted stock at that point, is coming up to boil here. So I'm gonna measure out my orzo. I'm gonna be doing eh, like half a cup. Putting that in the boiling stock. Then we're gonna season with salt and pepper. I'm gonna use a decent amount of salt because I didn't add a ton to my homemade stock. It's pretty neutral. You might wanna go easy if you're using store-bought because it can just be a little saltier out of the package. And I, by the way, I, this is like the first time in these past few weeks that I have ever had homemade stock to use. I have really enjoyed it, but in general, I am a fan of store-bought stock. I'm not trying to be some sort of stock snob. So we're gonna be letting that orzo cook for, the recipe recommends seven minutes. I'm gonna set a timer for five, calling for it to be tender, but still al dente. And yeah, the box suggests 11 minutes, so I'm gonna check it after five minutes, knowing that I'll probably hit that, uh, about that seven minute target time. So once we got the orzo in, we're gonna be reducing the heat and letting it simmer. Nice. And then only a few things to do really while we wait, one of which is I'm going to shred the chicken. If you hear anybody furtively devouring loose pieces of chicken skin in the next few seconds, it's not me. It's audio artifact. All right. Got a pretty large piece off and just gonna shred it with a couple of forks. So the fork method was cool. I'm doing a little bit of additional shredding with my fingers. My simmer on my orzo got a little low for my taste, so I'm turning the heat back up. Is it like a medium low? And then my final prep step, I'm gonna chop up a thingy of dill, a plastic thingy. I'm gonna do the whole thing, stems and all. Give it a pretty fine little chop. 
It smells so good. I'm no whiz at this stuff, but if it's summertime, put dill and stuff. It just has a cooling herbaceousness. Yeah, right? I think so. And yeah, I'm doing this whole little plastic clamshell of it. It's about like three ounces, I think. And that's it. That's all my prep. So a few seconds left here on my timer. Ultimately let it go to about the seven minutes dictated in the recipe. What can I say? I'm a follower. Can I check the orzo? Mm, oh yeah, it's getting there. It's still a little bit chewy, but I'm wagering by the time I finish all my other stuff, it will be precisely where I want it to be. And while I'm thinking of it, I'm going to add a little more salt because I could taste the broth and taste that it still wasn't quite where I'd like it to be. All right, so that's simmering away. And while it's doing that, I am going to do the most fun part, which is putting my eggs and lemon juice together in a bowl and whisking them. And then I'm going to put in a ladle full of the hot broth in there to, I think this is what is known as tempering. I'm not 100% sure, but I think so. I think I'm tempering these things together. It sort of like pre-incorporates them into the thing that you're ultimately going to be putting them in so that they just incorporate into the larger whole better. Maybe if I didn't do this, you would get more of an egg drop soupy consistency. Maybe this is the thing that makes you have a different egg outcome. So I've combined the lemon juice and the eggs. I'm whisking them together and you get this, immediately get this really neat opaque yellow color that is almost neon. It looks like it would be a pair of 90s bike shorts. I think it's cool. So then I'm going to ladle in, it says about a cup of the broth. I'm just going to eyeball it. Like one ladle full, two ladle fulls, some orzo made it in there. That's chill. I think. I'm unilaterally deciding that it is. And then whisk all that stuff together. And then we are going to add it back to our pan and it says stir just until the soup becomes opaque and thickens as the eggs cook one to two minutes. Then add in the dill, salt and pepper, and chicken. So all that stuff is going to happen at the very last minute. I'm just going to add this back in. And I might just stir it with my whisk because I already have it out. Actually, maybe not. My whisk has like sort of a plasticky coating. I'm not sure if that'll melt. I'll do it with a regular old spoon. I mean, I don't think I have to let this go very long. I don't know what accounts for it, but I'm getting a milkier texture than I was last time. A little less bright yellow, a little closer to white. I'm just gonna check and see how my orzo is doing texture wise. Mm -hmm. Yep, good texture. Just a little al dente, but no actual firm firmness anywhere. And just trying to make sure that I'm not getting any eggs stuck to the bottom. Call it good. Adding my dill. And I'm going to keep the heat on, but I'm going to turn it to low just so it stays warm while I'm doing all this stuff. But adding my chicken and just stirring, trying to get everything warmed through, but I think we're going to be good to go. Ooh, I used a lot of dill and I'm really happy about it. It looks really cool. There's a lot of green. Again, the summeriness. It's not very hot today, but even if it was, I would still eat this. Mmm, nice lemon smell coming off of it. Final taste test. Yep, just a teeny tiny bit more salt, a little more pepper, and we are gonna be good to go. Enjoy my chat with my grandma, Jan, I, I think you will. I know I always enjoy talking to her. She's a really 
incredible person who I'm very happy to be descended from. We learn, I, I will uh, break out of the pretending like I didn't already record the conversation to say that I learned some interesting things in here. I learned some interesting things about mental health issues that my grandpa experienced. I learned some things about my own anatomy and um, <laughs> that sounds weird. I just learned that we both have like weird, like ribs that are like too large on one side that my dad also had that, that my grandma also has apparently. And I just think it's really interesting. Uh, it, I, it was neat to talk to her in this way, in this context. And I really enjoyed it. And I am uh, proud to get to share a little bit of her with you all. So please enjoy. We're going to go enjoy this dinner and I'll talk to you afterward. And enjoy this soup if you make it. This call is now being recorded. Hello. Hello. It said it's being recorded. Thank you for joining me, uh, first of all. Um, Good. <laughs> uh, uh, how's, how's it going today? It's going fine. Uh, buddy and I took a little walk this morning, and then later on in the morning, I was out on the patio, and there was a great big rattlesnake down on the ground. My, my dick is, uh, you know, four feet off the ground, I guess. So I looked down and here was this big rattlesnake. Oh my I God. Know it was a, I didn't know it was a rattlesnake, but I'd, I'd seen some talk about that. And, and so I, it was a big, it was black, but it had yellow bands on it. And it was like, it was a, a diameter of a, like a garden hose. And about four feet long, but it was traveling. I mean, it it was going went under my big tree in front and a bunch of uh, bushes and stuff. So I didn't follow it, but <laughs> I did take time to look at it and you know to, to remember to look it up and it showed a picture of it just just fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. But I knew that there were snakes here because I I have this uh, email or letter thing from the, this area, and people, several people, have said, "Oh, you know, there's there was a, a snake in my yard. I don't know what it is. Here's a picture of it." And then finding out that it was a rattler, but there are other, you know, other snakes too. So. Um, not at all odd to, to have them around. It's just I hadn't seen them, and I was really surprised at this guy because he's so big. He was just going straight north to the to the neighbors, I guess. <laughs> well, I wonder if he's on some sort of migratory pattern or something. I don't know. And this time of year, when it's warmer, they come out. Mm. So, you know, in wintertime, they're probably underneath my, my deck. I don't know. They haven't paid any rent to me, so. <laughs> 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 so I'm not as, as afraid of them. I don't, don't scream or cry or anything <laughs> when I see it, when I see a snake. But I don't really go out and poke them with a stick either, so <laughs> it's better that way. <laughs> that was my excitement for the day, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. But uh, so I guess first off, I would love to know where cooking does or does not fit into your life at the moment. Well, not really. Um, because I was, I was thinking the other day, it's been at least 30 years since I was married and, or had a, uh, anyone that was living with me. So, um, <clears throat> I just sort of do whatever I want to and when I want to, and sometimes it's a bowl of popcorn and, and otherwise, I, you know, I don't mind cooking and I, I do cook for myself. I had uh, yesterday a 
a couple of uh, pieces of salmon and some salad, you know, a nice salad. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was good, but I had cooked two pieces of the salmon, and so I decided that uh, I would save one, and so then I had salmon salad for lunch today. So that, but I, but I really don't, you know, even think ahead about my food. I just sort of look in the refrigerator and freezer and cupboard and try to find something to eat, you know, to, uh, but <laughs> I, I I'm, I'm, don't keep sweets around, but sometimes I get really hungry for them. So yesterday I had, or day before I had a, a pint of ice cream that I mm. was really lousy because, no, it was, it was Ben and Jerry's, but it was some kind of cookie thing in. I was just picked it up at Walgreens and they didn't have much of a choice there. And it was, you know, like little marshmallowy things in the ice cream. So. I think I can do without that, but I don't know why they didn't have any vanilla or chocolate or <laughs> or, or pecan or something. <laughs> but I didn't want to go to another store. But I ate it every bit of it. <laughs> I was hungry for my sweets. But I, it's, I skipped the Snickers bar anyway. Oh, that's good. Do you... Yeah. Do, do you... Uh, have you always liked Snickers? Cause, cause dad really liked Snickers and I inherited, I think I inherited that. So I'm just wondering if it's genetic. Oh, really? Oh, yes. That's about the only thing I buy is my Snickers. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I try not to stock them in or not because I would eat them all. Oh, sure. Immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Or in a few days for sure. You know, I don't drink wine or liquor anymore, so except on very special occasions, I have a glass of wine. So, so I don't want to substitute as too many sweets for that stuff. And, but it probably is, it probably is why I, I'm so interested in sweets now. You know, if I can, if I go near a, a good bakery, I can't get by it without Spending twenty five dollars, <laughs> <laughs> so so that's that's it. But otherwise, my my uh, planning ahead doesn't work. And occasion, I don't, especially now, I don't eat out at all. But I I can pick up uh, stuff, you know, from from restaurants around town. But I've only done that about three times in. What five months or oh, wow. four four months? You no, know, uh -uh. uh -uh. I just make do with what I've got in the in the freezer, and it's enough to keep me uh, happy, my stomach happy. So that's good. When you were growing up, who did you see cooking around you? Uh, my mother and my sister Donna. I did uh, very little of it after uh, Donna was married and gone. Then I would, uh, you know, cook more with Mother. But before that, I, you know, I think she left the house probably when I was about twelve. Mm. And so up until up until that time, I didn't because the, the, those women did not want me around there. He, they. <laughs> 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 get, get away from here and then I was terrible about washing dishes I, I hated that and <laughs> we'd put up a fit uh, you know and I can remember as a probably a four year old when I just picked up all the silverware and threw them on the floor and was picking, <laughs> the, picking up the plates and <laughs> do them. somebody grabbed me and the plates I think and so that didn't go over well, but I, I really don't remember much about uh, that until I was uh, adolescent, and then I did a lot of it. But uh, so my, my mother did uh, teach me to cook. I had a home economics class uh, in school where they taught you to make a, a soup of oat. Of, what is it? A cream, a white sauce to make many kinds of soups and other things, but nothing very 
very interesting. And um, my, I spent quite a bit of time with my grandmother and grandfather too. And so grandma cooked chicken and noodles all the time because anytime mm-hmm. she had uh, company, that was what they had, and everybody just loved it because they were homemade noodles and mm-hmm. and and uh, chicken. And I didn't still make homemade noodles. I've done it about three times in my adult life. <laughs> 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 uh, Nana was telling me, oh, shortly before she moved into the uh, home, that she had decided to make it in her kitchen and make uh, noodles. And she says, you should have seen me. I was just covered with flour. (laughs) 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 She couldn't imagine making a mess like that when she was doing it with some frequency. (laughs) So so I'm, I'm pretty much that way, too. I get quite a bit of flour around, and it's not too much fun to clean up <laughs> nor is it you know and i don't have anybody to feed the noodles to anyway so <laughs> but i can do it, I can do it. <laughs> and would your um would your grandma do them in like a like a broth was it like soup or she's just serving the chicken over the the, the noodle uh she she but the, the chickens were just cut up but they they'd been boiling you know and as I remembered it, and then she used the broth of that to to make a or to put the the noodles in, and then they that thickened it uh, by itself. Mm. So uh, and then then of course it served with the chicken, and then she, and mashed potatoes. They always had mashed potatoes. Like plenty of starch there. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> but we all looked forward to it. We all just loved it. She, uh, Grandma had some kind of a special antenna when she, she knew that some of her kids were going to be visiting her for the weekend, or you know, for coming down on or coming around on Sunday, mm-hmm. and so she would she would always be ready for to make those that chicken and noodles, and everybody just loved it, and they were a noisy bunch. They were so different than, than the Pearsons. There, you know, there's just everybody around the table yelling at each other <laughs> and, and and talking and laughing and telling stories. And my grandpa, grandma and grandpa were both there. But uh, but my grandma, uh, grandma, grandpa Phillips lived in Bradgate, and most of the time we lived when we were still out in the country. It was probably only five miles into town. It seemed like a big trip at that that time to me, you know, because it was not something I'd walk to. But when my dad and mother would want to go out on a Saturday night to a dance or something or other, we they would take my brother Philip and I to Grandma's house, and we just slept there overnight. We, she had this kind I guess it was sort of a day bed. We thought of, a, of it as like a sofa or Davenport and my grandma and grandpa would be sitting in rocking chairs you know half the night playing cribbage <laughs> and so all all I can remember is 15-2, 15-4, a pair is six or whatever it is. <laughs> in, in later later years I, I did play it some uh, Tribute, but uh, I wasn't any good at it, but and I didn't care. But <laughs> <laughs> and, and another story about my grandparents: they were always both at home, as I knew them. So I guess my grandfather might have still been. He was a blacksmith in town, and he might have still been working some with, in my earliest remembrance, but. Uh, when I was three, four, five, six, they were both there, but, and and they continued to play cribbage all the time. Grandmother, my, I think Dad went, uh, Grandpa went to Des Moines for a contest one time and did real well, and then Grandma went a couple of years later and she won the whole oh. the whole thing. <laughs> And he, he was out of sorts about that. 
because <laughs> they were pretty competitive, I and they, they play they played with a, a piece of cardboard uh, between their knees. They faced each other out of their rocking chairs, and, <laughs> and so every once in a while they would would have to get a new piece of cardboard. <laughs> 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 but the other funny thing that happened, it must have been about once a year, they would just get into a hell of a argument about, about the game. And one or the other of them would get up and get that cardboard thing out and stuff it in the wood stove. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they have ever threw away the cribbage board, but that that cardboard cable thing <laughs> had to go. <laughs> and so then for maybe one or two more days, they didn't. They hardly would speak to each other. <laughs> and uh, but then they get over it, and then they start to play again. And so that would go on and on and on and on for weeks and months. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and my grand- grandmother was uh, short and, fa- and kind of fat, and uh, Grandpa was six foot and skinny. Mm-hmm. So I, I always thought they were the Jack Spratt could eat no fat, and his wife could eat no lean. That's <laughs> 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 just the way they look. He, to me, as a little kid, he looked like he was. Twice as tall as Grandma. But they, <laughs> but, but they, they, she had thirteen babies. Wow. And and two two kids uh, didn't make it. They died as as infants. But the other eleven grew up and were alive. You know, for most because I knew them and. And they were living close enough usually that they did visit Grandma and Grandpa uh, quite a bit. So then I had lots of cousins. I think there were about 30 cousins on that side. Wow. And that so that was fun, you know, for the kids. Oh, boy, Patsy's coming this week, you know. <laughs> the whole, um, all of them. And, and they had some that were Donna's age and some that were Jim's age and some that were my age, you know, within a few years, and we just had the most fun playing with our cousins, and we're so pleased about it, but uh, we were having fun, and then when we got older, some of the older ones would be outside smoking cigarettes, and mm-hmm. and my, uh, my, one of my cousins, she talked about them drinking, Oh. And and I didn't not not the kids the old you know their parents and uh, I didn't I didn't realize that they were and she well what did you think they were doing in that other room you know <laughs> I didn't know I I thought they were yelling at each other and laughing I didn't, know. <laughs> I didn't didn't care. But uh, maybe that's why the talk got so loud. <laughs> <laughs> and my grand uh, grandparents didn't drink anything at all, any alcohol. But I guess it was when my brother Phil got married, uh, and Grandma was at the at the wedding. It was in in Fort Dodge, and Jim said, "Grandma, uh, can I get you something to drink?" And she looked kind of startled, and then she said, "He said." Uh, do you want a pop? Yes. You didn't say sodas in Iowa. So, do you want a pop? And Grandma said, that swill. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't pick that stuff. Of course, the boys just doubled up over laughing and teasing my Grandma. Because they, knew, they both knew that she would not drink that swill. <laughs> Oh, dear. She was kind of ahead of her time there, I think. Uh, I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> I, 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 I'm the same way. I don't drink that swill either. I don't really <laughs> like soda very, very much. <laughs> oh, dear. Ultimately, we did move into town, and I went to school in Bradgate. In my 
my school, uh, there were 13 kids in my class. Wow. So, so yeah. So there was, they, you knew all their names for sure and seen them but it's practically like your brothers and sisters. Sure. But that was a very small school and of course the, it, it, it didn't have any variation in classes. I didn't have algebra till I moved to Fort Dodge. And then I had a heck of a time with it. And uh, your grandpa used to travel. He was at ISU in Ames, which is about 60 miles away. But he would be home and he we were, you know, going out for the whole weekend. But on his way back to Ames, he would stop and at my house to see me and he would try to teach me algebra <laughs> <laughs> and I was just so so befuddled with it I would practically be in tears all the time because I couldn't figure out how it, how to do it <laughs> so, so eventually after I was about 40 I could do it pretty good but <laughs> <laughs> all by myself. All by myself. Real romantic to uh, teach you algebra on a on a date. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he was in engineering, of course. You know, and he, he har- hardly could remember what algebra was. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. So, but another, uh, I was a, a reader forever. Um, the, the only, I think about the only one in my family that was, uh, was Donna did other, you know, she did, uh, crafts and, and cooking and stuff like that, but I didn't want to do that. I, I just wanted to read my books. <laughs> and, uh, and as a, a child, we didn't have access to books. We, you know, nobody would buy books. I think we had about three books in the household, but that they're in the fire department in Bradgate. And this was, a, a, of course, a volunteer fire department, but in one little building. But once, once a week, I guess, the traveling uh, library would come through. And they would switch out the books. So I was always very keen to get get there and get get my books and uh, you know reading the Bobsy Twins and Hardy Boys and and, and anything else that I could handle. <laughs> but but I always loved it. I whenever I was sitting still, I was reading a book, and that was very unusual in in our household. So, I mean, my mother did like to read. She'd read the newspapers, and so did Donna. And they they could read, but they didn't, weren't entertained by it for some reason or other. I don't know. But I was so grateful for that library. I thought I was in heaven when I could go in and get the next Bob C. Quinn book. <laughs> so. Now, in the Bob C. Quinn, they also solved mysteries, right? They, they were, yeah, they were you know, getting into trouble with something or another. Something kind of scary was happening to them, and, and then that would get uh, resolved. But then the Hardy Boys were more of a mystery. Mm. The very, very simple. I'm sure for third, you know, third graders, fourth graders, maybe. Then when I got to be an adolescent, I, I had to have movie magazines. For some reason, I had I could I had enough money that I could buy those movie magazines, and I'd take the pictures out of them and put them up on my walls and my ceilings and in my bedroom. Did you have favorites oh. that you followed, or just anybody? Alan Ladd would have been one, and then some of the singers. The, Bing Crosby would have been too old, but some of the younger ones. The, of singers that we liked, and of course, eventually Marilyn Monroe would show up. So in the, in the magazine, so that was the era. Lana Turner, Rita Hayworth were the ones that were a little bit older. The ones were the first ones that I remember. 
Did you get to go to the movies a lot? No, but I did. Uh, a girlfriend's parents did the movies in Humboldt. That was about 20 miles from home. And so occasionally I'd go with uh, that family. And that was a lot of fun. But in in Bradgate, earlier than that, they would show them in the summertime, they would show them outside on the side of a building, uh, movies. And it was, that was more like Costello and mm. uh, the ones just earlier than than that. Uh, not too long after the, you know, the, the talkies came in. We didn't, we, they, in fact, they did, would occasionally show some of the uh, silent movies on, on Saturday night on the, on the side of the barn. Uh, all the farmers would come into town on Saturday to buy their groceries and, uh, just have a little, a little fun, like going to the movie or some of the men would go to the bar, you know, they had, I think at one point they even had two bars in that little town. Oh my gosh, what a den of iniquity. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, my father was always there, so, but anyway, some and sometimes that mother was with him too, but <laughs> whatever. But, and, and mother was, I can remember being at the at the movies with me, because sometimes I must have been a, a kindergartner then, you know. So even in Bradgate, you just didn't want, want loose there in the dark, you know. So what what was it like growing up on the farm? Is it pretty much what people would imagine? Are you, were you working with animals a lot? Well, I was too little mm -hmm. uh, then, but no, I just I just had. Uh, Fun. I, I played with my brother was just uh, 16 months younger than I, and so I would be forever saying, "Butchie, let's you and me, you know, do something terrible." I know from stories, and not from remembering, but I crawled out an upstairs window and onto a roof that was uh, below me. And so then I said, hi, Gan. My dad was Glenn. And he, he, had, <laughs> he <both> faded. <laughs> 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 so, so, so that kind of thing. And then well, there were uh, they had, uh, farm elevators. It's just a, a big uh, a thing that that you can take grain up the up to the top of the barn or into the barn and dump it out there, and there's little plates all the way up that carry the grain up there. So, so one of the times, uh, the our billy goats went up there, so I went up there too, and that was very exciting for my parents. But I I just I just love to you know, climb things and. And do that, and I don't remember what, what poor little Butchie, my brother Phil. Uh, I don't think he did any of it. I think he was too scared. Oh man! He, he said, "Well, he was probably four. <laughs> 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 and he was Mama's baby, and I, I enjoyed making him cry any time. <laughs> I could manage it. I'm sure you did the same thing to your your little brothers, but it's you know kind of joyful when you can get them all upset. <laughs> we, had, we had a little bit more of an age difference. I mean, JP and I are six years. You know, we're yeah years apart. So there's definitely a, a little bit of that. There was a little bit of tormenting going on, but then. You kind of feel worse because you're at that point. I was already old enough to know better, so <laughs> yes. two or three times I can think of, you know, pranking him or jumping out and scaring him, or he had a a, a, a boo doll from Aladdin, and we still talk about this. And one time he was he was old enough to take a shower by himself, and I placed the doll just sitting looking <laughs> into the bathroom. So after he got out of the shower and it had these big scary it had this plastic head with these big scary eyeballs. 
and he came out of the shower, and oh god, he was so he just jumped. I mean, I'm we're all lucky that he didn't slip and hit his head or something. I felt so. Bad. It's inbred. Yeah, I guess. Your, your younger younger sibs. <laughs> <laughs> and Donna just hated me. You know, she just she was five years older and she just thought I was just awful. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother kinda of felt the same way, I think. But at that time I suppose she was tired of me torturing her baby. I don't know. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> Another favorite story of, of my dad was uh, we were out in a, a grove, you know, set of trees by the, by the farm, and uh, wandering around just just playing. And I there were big pigs out there. There, my dad raised hogs, and there were these big old pigs. There and I, and I said, "Oh, look at Butchie! Isn't that a big son of a bitch?" And <laughs> my dad was out there and heard me say that, and he, he had such a hard <laughs> time not not laughing himself to death. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I'd learned that word from him, so. <laughs> And the pigs were some big son of a bitches for sure. They were huge, and we shouldn't have been out there with them anyway. <laughs> but you know, we all grew up. Another thing I did when I was that age, probably five or six, I'd seen an Esther Williams show mm-hmm. some somehow. And so I declared that I was going to learn to swim. And so I, I, I you know, she did some diving. So I, I thought, well, I better learn to dive if I'm going to. <laughs> there yep. wasn't any water around to swim in. <laughs> but, so I got up in, in the in the barn in the haymow, and part of the haymow was higher than the other. It was, uh, uh, you know, just variations but we were up there in the in the t- higher stuff and I dived off the the haymow into the little bit of uh, straw down on the lower level it couldn't have been more than three feet high and it had a lot of give in it anyway <laughs> and oh, it knocked the it knocked the wind out of me and I was of course I was terribly scared does that ever happen to you to fall and, and lose your breath. Oh, yeah, yeah. Not for a long time, thankfully. But, yeah, definitely when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. So that's what happened to me. It hadn't happened to me before, and that really scared me. I thought I was dying there. When I was older, one of my breast bones, the side of my breast bones, stuck out farther than than the other side. And I just bet that was what it was from because that was the only – thing that, you know, I hadn't had any big falls or accidents other than that. <laughs> I, have, I mean, I one of my ribs, the bottom of my left rib sticks out further than my right and, and always oh. has. I wonder if it's not uh, genetic or maybe it's just the yeah. male injury it's, has echoed on through the generations. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't know either, but... Um, uh, your dad had uh, a, a thing. His his ribs uh, stuck out too far, I think, or mm. I don't know. So so that could be uh, genetic. And I didn't, you know, uh, this was when he was a, a baby or a little, little boy that the doctor brought it to my attention. They called it something. I can't remember what they. They called it, but um, it was some fault with the uh, the ribs, and I don't know. I guess he couldn't do his atlas training or whatever. <laughs> 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 so 
so maybe you got half of that. I don't know. It might be. I think it it might be on the same chromosome as the Snickers gene. <laughs> maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> was it a it a pretty big culture shock when you moved to Arizona? Yes, it was. It it really was. But we'd uh let's see, your granddad and I had moved from Humboldt because he's he worked for his dad who ran that concrete products plant and so he got a job in St. Louis with Swerdrup and Parcel, big engineering company. And so we lived I, there we maybe three years. So it might have been 61 or, or in there when when we were there, but maybe, and then I think it might have been 63 when we moved to Phoenix. But we did that because, uh, well, I was tired of snow and, and having to get my kids dressed up in snow clothes, you know, and out going out to play for 10 minutes and then coming in all wet and dra- <laughs> grabby. <and crabby. Okay. laughs> yeah. So, and then in, in St. Louis, it was, it was an in- interesting city and we did enjoy it in many ways. Um, they had a summer opera outside and that was fun. We used to go there quite, quite a bit. But, um, uh, mostly the, the Pearsons were you know, encouraging us to come down there. So, so that's what we wanted. Don didn't want to, Don didn't care about working for the engineering company. And he had basically a nervous breakdown while we were there. But anyway, he, I think as soon as he got a job lined up in Arizona, that's when we moved. But before that, he was, uh, you know, off work for a month or so because he was having trouble. That they, they, you know, called it a nervous strip breakdown. I don't know what what people call it now, but he was he was sick. He was mentally down. He was, you know, just really really depressed is what mm. it was. So. But uh, and then that was he got over it. I. At that time, I think the tranquilizers were a new thing, and so he had some of those things. Probably didn't help him. Probably depressed him more. I don't know. <laughs> but but anyway, uh, he was he was he was bad. He just could hardly get out of bed some days, and that was really really sad. But after he got to Arizona, then and uh, started working for the city of Phoenix. I think he was an assistant city engineer there, and he was fine with that. He liked that better than drawing little pictures on on a table, you know. And before you moved to Phoenix, you had spent some time in Japan as well, right? Yes, that's that's right. As soon as Don graduated from ISU, he'd been in ROTC, R-O-T-C, and then part of the deal is after that you have to go into the uh, military for, I think it was just two years, when your dad was only, you know, maybe a month and a half old. He left for Japan, and then I, uh, your dad and I went to Japan in February, and and that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have still been 18. And I I was... You know, traveling with that, with my baby who was four months old, I think. And we, I got on, I'd never been on a plane. I got on the plane with him and flew to San Francisco. And somehow I made it from the air, airport to the uh, uh, military base there. And so we had this spend a few days there. We'd already had a couple of days at, at one base, and then we had to go to another base from which we were going to fly out. And, you know, there wasn't any schedule about it. It was just whenever the Air, Air Force plane was going to go, you went. So I uh, 
was was there with with my sweet little baby, and he was a, he was a good boy, but um, then we had we got on the plane and we landed in Honolulu, and then we landed again at Wake Island. The second base that I stayed in with the baby was um, we stayed in a BOQ, a bachelor's officer's quarters, and it was just like a little hotel or motel kind of thing. But I went up to the desk with with my baby and asked if I could get a ride to the to a restaurant since I was starving to death. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, there were some uh, fellows standing there, and they said, "Oh, we're going over to the restaurant. Come on with us." We're just other uh, other uh, Air Force pilots and such. And so we went. So I went over to that uh, restaurant and uh, with him, and then I sat down and uh, tr- you know tried to eat and. And uh, the baby just wanted to cry all the time. He didn't like that restaurant, I guess. <laughs> so, <laughs> so one of one of the uh, people, the military guys, said, "Well, come on, let's go over and sit here." So we went into the bar and sat there with the military guys, <laughs> and they just played with the, your dad, and he was just as happy <laughs> as could be. <laughs> I think he wanted to join the Air Force himself, but <laughs> so and I, well, I ate my dinner and I was so happy because I, I in that whole four or five days, about any time I sat down with any kind of food in front of me, the baby would cry. <laughs> and, and of course, I couldn't stand to be in any public place with my baby crying while I was feeding my face. And <laughs> <laughs> I was I was starving to death at that time. I weighed 107 anyway, so I didn't. You know, it was just, it was just crazy. And of course, I was young, not very young, but I did take good care of him. But <laughs> <laughs> occasionally, you need four or five soldiers to take over just for a little bit. <laughs> Yes, and that was only one evening that that happened. I think the next the next day we all all flew to Japan, and on the on my flight to Japan, they assigned me this little second Louis. Uh, he was looked like he was about as old as I was, but and he certainly didn't know anything about a baby. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I practically had to dump DC in his lap before he <laughs> so I could go to the bathroom. <laughs> so, but there were some people there that were kind of like stewardesses. But it wasn't till the last lap of that visit that they ch- ch- said I could uh, fold the back of the seat down and he could s- stretch out and sleep, which he did instantly when I put him down there. But the other two eight-hour planes, I had to hold him, and and he couldn't. He would fit in the seat, but he wasn't comfortable there. His head would be hitting the arm or something, you know. So, so he was having a terrible time with it. And but we, he finally got some rest in the, going from Wake Island to uh, Tokyo. Tokyo Arimas, that's what they say, in the, the train and the, everywhere. That means Tokyo, we're here. Or Kobe Arimas, was, was one of my few words I learned in Japan. But that was a good thing. All the, we had all these young Air Force uh, guys. Some of them were navigators. Some of them were pilots. And some of them were... Uh, just gr- ground workers like like Don, but um, but anyway, they all, all we all came about the same time, and we were uh, uh, about six of us couples in uh, were in the BOQ for a couple of weeks, so we got to know each other, and and had a really good time. After a couple of weeks. We got a. They assigned us to a house, and so we were in Kobe, 
and it was all furnished and so um it was, you know it was very very livable uh we, and we we enjoyed it there were rats but <laughs> They mostly didn't come out till night, so <laughs> I was terrified of them because I, I, you know, I had heard about rats climbing up in baby beds and biting the babies and chewing on their babies. So I was really, really worried, as was was Don. Both of us were, but there wasn't wasn't much that we could do about it. They did. We did finally get poison to put in the walls or something and the, the rats went away but it was it was very scary you know we'd be sitting at our little table eating dinner and here would come a rat <laughs> 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 really entertaining <laughs> <laughs> so that, you know it was one one bedroom but that was fine because then we had our a baby bed in the in the bedroom with us and we had a little uh, just step out patio from the bedroom. And in the springtime, we've been there a few months, but the cherry trees came in to bloom. And there was one huge one right outside our balcony. Just gorgeous. They're so pretty. They're pink flowers and just mm. wonderful things. That's you've, uh, you've traveled quite a bit over the years. Has that mm. informed your kind of informed your culinary horizons or what you like to eat or what you like to cook? Yes. We had, uh, by that that time, of course, I was traveling by myself in the uh, late 90s and, and onward from then. But I went first to my uh, brothers. Uh, my brother had lived there for, I think, but must have lived there for 30 years by the time he passed away. But he had a nice... A house in Germany, an apartment actually, and his adopted son lived downstairs. And anyway, those, the, the, any of the women we saw were wonderful cooks. And so I, I did enjoy, uh, that, you know, enjoy the, the German food. And, but, but it wasn't something I was going to cook. But by that time I was single, I guess. I guess, I, yes, I was. But we had fun once. I, we went to uh, Ireland with two girlfriends, and that was that was nice. And of course, that was different. And there too, the food was was interesting, but was nothing that I brought home. I wasn't. I guess I wasn't even thinking too much about cooking then because I was finished with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but. Uh, but it it was 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 fun. We stayed at B and B's all the time, and then that's where I fell and broke my ankle. Yeah. And yeah. And so other than that, uh, well, well, you went to Italy mm -hmm. with us, and then after that, Polly and I went to Spain. Mm. So, so those are the only uh, countries that I have uh, that I've visited. Well, I did Peru too, and and uh, there too, the, uh, there was some interesting food. Uh, Peru was very, very interesting. Of course, it's totally different culture from Europe. But I still want to go to Portugal. Ooh, yeah, that would be. And, and Greece would be be nice too. Yeah. Well, speaking of travel, didn't you and Polly take a tortilla making class a few years ago? We went to Mexico. That's right. For, for a cooking thing, and that was fun. But you know, it was I was happy. Good Lord, there's a whole bunch of police cars out on the. I've seen five of them out on the main road uh, going by between the trees. I will wonder what's happened. Anyway, um, yes, we did, and that was that was a lot of fun because we were just staying out in the country and and living in a little country uh, motel kind of thing, and then we'd go over to the uh, hacienda 
which was an old hacienda. You know, the, all the build, buildings uh, built around the courtyard in the middle, and the courtyard was very pretty. It was was um, kind of going to seed, but it was it was fun. And there, there were some women that did their cooking. They were supposed to be instructing us, and, some, and sometimes they did. But I knew that I wasn't going to be cooking over a clay stove or anything. When I got home, but, I, but it was still, it was still fun. I mean, I enjoyed it and enjoyed being with the the people. And we mostly women. There were about ten of us all that had made the trip, and he came from all over the country. Uh, several of the women were um, owned uh, eating places, mm. and so they were you know, there to to learn things. But uh, very pleasant and uh, and pretty, and we had they bring out these big tubs of Mexican beer when we had our our meals, and uh, they cooked you know three meals for us every day. So it was it's really a, a fun thing. And one day we went over to a farm. This this guy has a um, store out in Napa. And he, he grew tired of trying to get decent beans, and so he started importing them from, from. Uh, oh, now the cops are going the other way. Well, so maybe it's all over. So, it, so uh, he got connected with these, this, these farmers down. We were outside of Mexico City, maybe 50 miles from Mex- from the city of Mexico City. And uh, but in, he these farmers raised these beans for him, and then he brought them up to Napa and sold them. But they're really good beans. I still order them from uh, Napa because they really are especially tasty. And then the, we ate. Uh, the farmers made this big f- feast for us, and they dug, had dug a hole and then put put the uh, palm leaves over it and you know that kind of stuff and cooked we, they said it was a sheep we were sure it was a goat but it didn't matter it didn't taste good so they'd cook that you know overnight on this in this pit oh yum so, yeah that was very very interesting so it was fun to watch those women cook whether we were cooking or not I'm I'm wanting to go to Maine I've never mm-hmm. been in that area have you I haven't. I've never, never really been. No. Yeah. You, so you got your New Yorker stuff in, but not much else in the East, huh? Yeah, not really. Definitely not up to like Maine or, or Vermont. I spent a good deal of time in New Hampshire, but yeah, not the, not the real sort of, oh. I was never on a lot of yeah. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think I want to go to Maine and, um, uh, I'm feeling very, very much better, so I think I could do that. And I just, I wouldn't even mind going by myself. I'd just get on a plane and rent a car out there and and enjoy it. But I, I want to have some real lobster. I love lobster, and only get to have it about once every three years. <laughs> so, but I, I just am interested in that in seeing that country. That will be a fine thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I it seems beautiful. I would love to go. I don't really know, you know, I I haven't really spent that much time in, you know, northeastern coastal mm-hmm. really. I read Moby Dick a few years ago and I thought, "Oh, I would really love to go to like Nantucket." Just seems uh, yeah, fascinating and beautiful. Yes. Yes. I should read that again. Well, so. thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it and appreciate you taking the time. And it's, uh, it's neat. I, I also just, you know, I think of so many times in my life and, and trips that we went on that were so important to me. You know, you were the first person to take me to New York and we went to Italy and all these mm, different places. Yeah. And I just am, am, you know, pretty darn lucky in a lot of ways. And one of those ways is is having you as a, a grandma. You've really mm. just Influenced my life. Well, good. <laughs> so much oh, in good. So many positive ways, and it turns out maybe 
in the fact that my ribs are uneven is in, included in that. <laughs> good, good. Well, oh, listen, my, the, the, when the doctor told me about your uh, dad's ribs, um, he the doctor also said that your dad had the same problem. And, of course, I hadn't ever noticed it, and nobody ever managed, uh, mentioned that. It certainly isn't anything. <laughs> I think it's just really terrible, but uh, it, it definitely is part of the family tree, apparently. <laughs> if uh, those two did it, and, and you have half of it, so. <laughs> <There you go. laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, oh, dear. Okay, well, I've enjoyed it, honey, and I'm sorry I don't have any recipes. But, uh, <laughs> That's okay. You're, you're, uh, you're, more like, you're more like Haley. You're more of an intuitive cook you <laughs> yes. and then you you put it together that's right, that's right. <laughs> well thank you grandma yeah i hope that i can see you sometime this summer or this fall whenever but uh, i'm happy here and you're happy there so that's exactly. the best thing okie doke honey love okay. you so thank much, you. Thank so you. much. Thank you. have okay. a good day bye bye That is it. That is all for this week's episode of Stay for Dinner. Thank you again to Granny Jan for joining us. Two two grandmas in the books, one grandma and a grandma-in-law yet to go. I am very excited about this project. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps more people find the show, and that helps there be more show. I honestly really try not to read the reviews just as kind of a practice, but I saw some very nice ones on Apple Podcasts out of the corner of my eye, or at least they looked nice when I was brushing past them in a browser window. Thank you for that, and if you haven't left one yet, please, please consider doing so. I am at DC Pearson on Twitter or at D-E-E. C-E-E Pearson on Instagram. Uh, If you decide to cook along at home, please tag me. I would love to see your food and I would love to hear how it went. Uh, You can also reach out to the podcast at stayfordinnerpod at gmail.com. If you have any questions, comments, uh, recipe requests, anything like that would be awesome to hear from you. My interstitial music is by Advance Bass, the amazing Owen Ashworth. My intro song is July 4th, 2004 by Jason Anderson. And the cover art is by Sarah Beacon. That's B-E-C-A-N. I have written a couple of novels, The Boy Who Couldn't Sleep and Never Had To, and Crap Kingdom. Please support your local bookstore in whatever form they exist in right now. And if you like hearing me talk, I also read the audiobook versions of both of those books. And that is, that's it. That's all for now. Have a great week. Bye. Bye.